We are going to be picking up in our study of Romans here in just a moment. Uh, A couple things before we do that. I've been told to let you know if you happen to have one of your applications ready for the academy. uh, My dad said you can give that to me, and he said I can get that to him. So if you have one ready tonight, then uh, you can get those to me before you leave, before I leave, and I'll make sure it gets to the right place. Also, uh, for those who were not here last week, uh, either in the morning or the evening, I still have some of these outlines for Romans, kind of like the bookmark. So if you aren't here, if you would, just raise your hand, and uh, we'll make sure that you get one of those. Ben, can I ask you to help out with these, brother? Thank you. And so what those are is just for you to keep. It's got my outline that we'll kind of be working through, the the big outline, but it also has the shortened, more condensed outline there. And so hopefully this will kind of cover everybody, and everybody will have it. And you can keep it there where we are in the book, and hopefully that will help you in your personal study as well, kind of as you're reading ahead and uh, preparing for class on your own time also. If you would raise your hand one more time just to make sure that Ben doesn't skip you. And I think we had one or two down over here. And I I can certainly print more of those out. And so I'll print a few more out, and then what I'll do is we'll just set those back in the foyer starting uh, for next Sunday evening. I think we're good. Thank you, Ben. And so, like I say, we are continuing our study here. And where we are is actually in the introduction still. I mentioned last week that really the book of Romans is interesting as far as how long this introduction is. It had the longest greeting that we looked at in those first seven verses last week. So when we think about those first seven verses, what do we find out about the book of Romans? Starting with verse 1, who do we find is writing it? Paul. Paul is writing it. How did Paul describe himself at the very beginning of this letter? He's a bondservant, right? Bondservant meaning he's a slave, and who is it that he is serving? The Lord Jesus Christ, and ultimately serving God in that. And so we find that at the very beginning, but then Paul moves into talking about something really important. What does Paul discuss in detail really in verses 2 through 4? Right, he talks about the gospel. Uh, right there, those, those few verses, Paul lays out exactly what the gospel is. That's how Paul is serving Christ Jesus. That's how he's serving God. He is an apostle meant to spread the gospel. He says what it is. And what had the Romans done with that gospel? Had they obeyed it? Right, how do we know they had obeyed it? They are called saints once we get into verse 7. And of course, verse 7 shows us that it's the Romans who this is being written to, all those uh, who are beloved of God, who are saints in Rome. And so that's where we looked at, or all that we looked at last week. So we'll continue then on in the introduction into verses 8 to 17 tonight. And really what we're looking at in this section of the introduction is that Paul's laying out his desire. Uh, It's not uncommon in a lot of the books or the letters that Paul would write that he kind of at the beginning says what he would like or what he's been doing. Uh, He kind of follows the same format here in Romans. Think about in a lot of the letters that Paul writes after that initial greeting, he goes on to kind of talk about some of his prayers concerning these brethren and then gets to the point of why he's writing. And that's what we have in this particular section this evening. So we'll start out verses 8 through 10 and we'll look together here dealing with Paul's prayers. If somebody could read for us Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, with, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayer, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged 
by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And that's good right there. Thank you, brother. And so looking in those verses, and specifically 8 to 10, we find uh, some, something about Paul's prayers. Looking in verse 8, uh, he kind of you know, gives us a little bit of a marker. He says, first, well, he's letting us know, before I get to really what I'm wanting to write to you about, I do want to make mention of this. We understand how that's done. We do that a lot of times in our conversation as well. So what's the first thing that Paul wants to note to these brethren? Right. He's thanking God through Jesus for all of his brethren. Now, we talked a little bit about it uh, in the background to the book, but Paul had not actually been to Rome at that point. Uh, it's very possible Paul didn't know too many of the members of the congregation there in Rome, yet Paul was still thankful for them. That's a, a powerful thing, is it not? It's, it's easy for us to be thankful for the congregation right down the road that we have close connections with. You know, we can think about North Jefferson. We do a lot with North Jefferson, and certainly we're all thankful for the congregation there. But what about the congregation several states over where we may not really know anything about them? Do we thank God for them? What about the congregation on the other side of the world? Maybe they speak another language from us. It's another culture entirely. Are we thankful for them? I think there's something important here in what Paul is doing that maybe that's teaching us a, a good lesson. Because Paul's thanks was not uh, so much for the individuals. Yes, that's involved in it. But more than anything, I believe Paul's thanks here is for the church. If we are thankful for the kingdom, if we're thankful for the church, then it's going to be that much easier for us in our prayers to thank God, maybe even at times for these congregations that we've never been to. And so that's something that I believe we can learn from this. But there's something else as it relates to prayer uh, that Paul is doing here. Think about the, the structure that Paul gives. Who is it that he's thanking? He's thanking God, and, and how is it that he thanks God? Through Jesus. And so we can see the process of prayer, the prayer directed here to God, and of course then through Jesus. And we could think back to some of the classes we had in that Sunday night series we did on prayer a while back, and we understand Jesus being the mediator, that Jesus is the reason that Paul or we can have access to God the Father. And so Paul lays that out, uh, that structure for prayer. He thanks God always for you all. Now what's the reason that Paul gives as to why he's thanking God for these brethren? So what, what then is faith? Alright, so there's a system of faith. Um, we think about what, what Paul's thanking them for here. Do we think Paul is thanking God for the system of faith? Okay, so then what are we talking about? Their faith in Him. Now, it all goes back to the system of faith. Because if we have faith in God, if we have faith in Christ in that system, then something is going to be uh, um, brought forth in our life, right? How, how do we know then with these brethren in Rome, how do we know that they were bringing forth fruit? Because this is known throughout the world for it. Exactly. It's known throughout the world for nothing. Right. If, if all they did was simply... <laughs> Um, accept the system of faith, if all they did was simply mentally accept and believe, okay, Jesus, uh, he, He's been promised by all the prophets. Jesus is the one who's born uh, according to the flesh of the seed of David. He's the one who then died and, and was proven with power by the Holy Spirit, uh, ultimately to be the one from God, verses 2 through 4. And if all they did was mentally accept that and then do nothing with it, would their faith have been known throughout all the world? No. You see, this is a good example we can point to to show that faith is going to have some sort of fruit. True faith is going to have certain work attached to it. It's nothing that's done to merit anything, but if we truly believe in that system of faith, it's going to change the way that we live our lives. Others are going to be able to see that in us. Now, what are some possibilities as far as how uh, for these brethren in Rome, how their faith had become known throughout all the world. Maybe because of the persecution they endured? Right. 
Uh, we talked about the, the expulsion that came from the Emperor Claudius, where he sent all the Jewish Christians and Jews out of the city. Get out of here. You can't be here. Well, as they left, they're scattered. Think about the book of Acts. Anytime persecution came for anyone who was a Christian, what generally happened? As they were scattered, they went preaching, right? They shared the gospel, that system of faith, with others. So that's a real strong possibility. Uh, there's maybe another possibility as well. And, and I think maybe what the other one would be is, is the idea all roads lead to Rome. Um, so, yes, you would have some of those who scatter preaching the gospel and you know, telling others about the church in Rome, but you still would have had Gentile Christians back in Rome. And so anyone doing business or traveling, they'd have been going to Rome or messages coming out of Rome so it's a real possibility then that, uh, that there were people traveling through stopping and worshiping with the saints in Rome. Somehow, some way, their faith was being known throughout the world. And that's a, a powerful thing. Johnny? I was going to say, you know, Christ told us that we would be known as Christians for our love mm -hmm. and being evidently demonstrated their love for each other demonstrated their love for others the example that they set and I can say we're to go into the world but he doesn't say we have to each one of us has to physically go somewhere right. else but wherever we go we take his message his love with us mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, that, and the love is so important in that, um, especially even you know, when we get to the latter part of the book of Romans, especially uh, kind of chapters, well, really we can just say 12 to 16 in the end, all that application. So much of that has to do with love, and all of that is when we're living by faith. And so the Romans were exemplifying that. Like you say, they're living in love, others could see it. And that's a, an important thing. And when we live in that love today, Others are going to see it as well. And we're going to be doing all we can uh, to spread and to share that love with others. Now, we'll mention something here in a little bit. Uh, so hopefully I will remember uh, to come back to this verse when we get there. I'm mainly saying this because I feel like if I say it out loud, I might remember it better. But that doesn't mean anything. You can ask Autumn. I forget things all the time. So that's, uh, that's what we have at least there in verse 8. Moving into verse 9. Uh, in verse 9, we see that Paul is more or less looking to give some surety to the brethren concerning what it is he's just said. Uh, he's just said, of course, I thank God for you. Uh, he's always thanking God for them. And then he goes on, verse 9, to say that God is my what? So he's pointing to God to say, okay, God is the one who can testify to this fact. God is the one who can testify to these things. And with that, then, he says something else about uh, his relationship to God. So skip over the middle part of the verse, and let's see what it is he's saying that God can testify. You go to the end of the verse, and so really the point Paul's making in this, for God is my witness that without ceasing I do what? I make mention of you in my prayers. Now what's the frequency that he does this? Without, uh, without ceasing, it's always. He is consistently praying for the church, praying for these brethren in Rome. Does that make us think of some other verses in some of Paul's other letters? It's not uncommon that Paul was praying always for his brethren. Now again, in some of those other letters, we recognize the fact Paul had close relationships, personal relationships with the brethren there. In Rome, we don't really see that to be the case. And so Paul... Uh, cared deeply about the church. That's why I said earlier, it's not as much about the individuals as much as it is that Paul is thankful for the church. And certainly we can understand Paul would be thankful for the faith of these brethren. Like Johnny's point, he'd be thankful for the love of these brethren. And so Paul is able to say, okay, God is my witness in these things. How could he say God is my witness? God witnesses everything. He witnesses everything, and more than that, we're talking about prayer, right? Oh, yeah. Who did Paul say all of this thanksgiving is to? It's to God. 
to God through Jesus. And so we recognize then God is the one who could witness it. Uh, certainly we understand that, that Paul is not going to be lying about something like that. And, you know, it, there's no, no need for us to uh, go around lying about anything like that either. And so Paul can clearly point to and say, God is my witness in these things. But let's look now at the middle of that verse uh, to get a little more about Paul's relationship, about the type of person uh, that Paul was. So concerning God who is his witness, Paul says, Whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. All right, so who is Paul serving? He's serving God. Now, going back up into verse 1, who else is Paul serving? Jesus Christ. And so we recognize Paul in serving Christ is serving God. Think about the gospel. Uh, and, and really, I guess we can make the point now. If you look in verse 1, who is the gospel attributed to? In, in verse 1, to God. The gospel of God. Now, you look in verse, uh, in verse 9... And he talks about he serves God with his spirit in the gospel of who? Of his son. So we have the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus. Are we talking about the same thing? Exactly, yeah. We're talking about the same gospel. It's the good news that originates from God concerning his son Christ Jesus. That was Romans 1, 2 through 4. So to serve Jesus then is to serve who? It's to serve God. And if we're serving God will ultimately be serving Jesus in the same manner. But notice how it is that Paul serves God concerning the gospel. What, in what way does he do this? So what's it mean if Paul is serving God with his spirit? Sometimes I think your spirit is kind of in relation to your personality and your your being, per se. And so whenever he says, I worship with my spirit, your spirit is kind of, I take it as who, what kind of makes, like that's what is in, that's what's worshiping God, that's what's obeying God is your spirit, your want to do that. Right, and, and I think that that's, that's on the right track there. Let me get to Johnny. Well, in keeping with that, in other words, he was serving God with all of his being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, and that's to your point. Yeah, and that's what, Geraldine, you know, to your point, that, that it's, it's more or less who you are. So, with everything that Paul has, what is he doing? He's serving God. He's serving Christ Jesus. What's his mission in that service? It's the Gospel. Should it be any different for us today? <laughs> Should we not be doing everything we can with all that we have to be sharing the gospel with others? Paul makes it very clear, especially in these 17 verses, how important the gospel is to him. Whenever we get down into verses you know, 13 to 15, and he starts talking about how he's a debtor, how he owes this debt to all these people, well, the way that he recognizes he can at least work to pay the debt back is to continue in this service with all of the Spirit. Because he's going to reach the point, the only thing he can do to try and pay the debt back is ultimately to share the Gospel. It's to share that good news that Jesus is the one who was promised long, long ago by the prophets. He's the one who's born according to the flesh by the seed of David. He's the one who, yes, He died, but He rose again by the power of God through the Holy Spirit. And of course, in that Gospel, and what Paul later reveals in the book of Romans we have the same hope of the same type of resurrection as well. And so Paul is emphasizing all of these things. He serves God with all of his being in the gospel of his Son. He's thankful. He's praying for these brethren. And more than simply uh, making thanksgiving for them, moving to verse 10, how else or what else is Paul doing in his prayers? And what, what specifically is that request for? Right. Paul wants to go to these brethren. I already mentioned the fact he hadn't been there yet. Uh, he wanted to be there with them. And in the particular verse here, we find uh, that Paul is wanting to do this uh, 
by whose will? By God's will. He, he wants to make sure that he does this in uh, the right way. It's interesting whenever we start to look at when it is that Paul comes to Rome. If you look at the, the last several chapters in the book of Acts, uh, we kind of find where Paul's on trial time and time again. And everything he's doing is ultimately reaching the point where he can make it to Rome. But before Paul finally gets to Rome, uh, do you remember what all he went through to get to that point? Of course, we talk about the trials. There's certain imprisonment with that. He had to get on a ship, and as Aaron mentions, there's shipwreck. Uh, Somewhere along the way, he's bitten by a snake, right? Uh, All of these things, but he ultimately makes it to Rome. Probably not in the way he thought he would get there. Probably not the way he wanted to get there. But that was ultimately God's will for how he needed to get there. And so Paul was willing then to submit to God's will in these things. Yes. I kind of feel like whenever through all of his tribulations and things he went there in order to try and get to Rome, I feel like that was God's will, but I also feel like that was the devil trying to make that hard for him because mm-hmm. he really desperately longs to be with these brethren, and so I feel like that was probably Satan trying to... Right, there are certain roadblocks that would come in the way. I think about, um, oh, where is that? I think it's First Thessalonians, and I believe it's chapter... Yeah, three, four, somewhere in there. Uh, chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians 2, and specifically with the brethren in Thessalonica, but to show that that could be a real possibility. Uh, verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 2 says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Verse 18, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. And so absolutely, part of it could be the fact that, that Satan is throwing all of these things there, trying to prevent it from happening. And um, whenever we get down into verse 13, uh, yeah, when we hit verse 13, uh, we'll look at another verse as well that will show at least uh, Paul in the moment when he's writing the letter, what it was that was keeping him from being there at, at that particular time. Brandy? Mm-hmm. And Paul did. He, through all those trials, he still counted it joy in those trials. And so he very happily accepted what the Lord will for Which is an extremely difficult thing to do. You didn't hear Brandy talking about how um, there are times that we might say, if the Lord wills or Lord willing, uh, we will do this. But sometimes it's almost like we don't really mean it. Uh, because if it doesn't happen then we, we kind of become upset and at times we can become angry in that. Uh, but with Paul, when he said, you know, if this is the Lord's will, well, it really seems like Paul was content if it wasn't the Lord's will as well. And that's a, a, a powerful thing. And, and kind of moving on or thinking about that as well, uh, when we look at why it is Paul wanted to be with them, uh, to think about that fact that he was fine if he didn't get there, but if he does get there, how much sweeter it will be because of what it is that he was looking to accomplish with these brethren. Uh, moving into verses 11 and 12, we kind of see more specifically what his desire concerning the brethren in Rome, Rome was. Uh, Benjamin read for us a moment ago verses 11 and 12, and so we'll just kind of keep moving here. And in verse 11 specifically, Uh, Paul, he shows his desire, for I long to see you. Uh, He says, for I long to see you. And what's the reason that he wanted to? Right, he says, I want to impart. And uh, and look again, are we talking uh, plurality or singular gift here? Some. Some spiritual gift. Now, the reason I emphasize that is sometimes whenever we get to the point... Anytime we say spiritual gifts, a lot of times we jump immediately to miraculous, whereas gift is not always necessarily miraculous. Um, We have to understand context as well in these things. So when we get later on into Romans, uh, 
Uh, Paul does talk about certain spiritual gifts where some are miraculous, but some are not miraculous. So if we jump over to Romans uh, chapter... Oh, let me think. Romans chapter, I believe it's 12. Yeah, Romans 12. And somebody read for us Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy if in proportion to our faith. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in, in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so I bring that out again to make the point. We have to look at context to understand are we talking miraculous or non miraculous? There in Romans 15, and we'll talk more about that when we specifically get there. But just to you know, bring it out, there are some there that, that probably are miraculous. You think about prophecy. Uh, there could be something with the ministering. There could be something with the teaching that might be miraculous. But whenever we look at what else Paul includes, exhorting, the idea of encouragement, giving, leading, uh, showing mercy, there's not really anything miraculous about that but Paul still considers them to be certain gifts. And um, when we look, though, in Romans 1, I'll get to you in just a second, Johnny, and then I'll get to Madeline. Uh, when we look, though, back in Romans 1 and verse 11, I, I feel like there it probably is something miraculous because of the way that he goes about it. Because who is it? Well, uh, it's Paul, but Paul is wanting to impart to them some spiritual gift. Well, who is Paul? An He's an apostle. And what is it that apostles could do that no one else could? To impart certain spiritual gifts. And that deals with the miraculous. Uh, Johnny and then Madeline. Well, uh, you know, talking about that, we well, remember how he taught Apollos because he had not been baptized mm -hmm. in Christ. And so he taught him what he needed to know is salvation. You know, there's some things that they need. Like if they're not fully following the correct doctrine or you know, some things that they haven't learned that they need to know or they might need one of these miraculous gifts to help them confirm the word that they are Mm -hmm. And ultimately what, what he's looking to do, and he says there at the last part of the verse, is he's wanting to do it so that they could be what? So they could be established. The idea of really being strengthened and kind of solidified in those things. And so, yeah, that's a good point uh, to bring out, Johnny. <coughs> Madeline? So just a, a quick look at it, um, it kind of involves there um, the idea of sharing or distributing something. Um, there is the aspect of, you know, telling and teaching that. And uh, so that is part of it. And things are going a little bit haywire here for me. Um, but I, I will look into that more, though, and I'll let you know whenever I've got... This is cooperating with me. Um, but yes, there is an aspect of it, though, that does deal with teaching. Uh, but as far as the word itself, I remember right, deals with just any sense of sharing or distributing something. But I'll, I'll come back to that whenever I'm able to look at that more. Um, and so Paul's looking then to impart some spiritual gift uh, to these brethren, uh, to Johnny's point, to then be able to es help establish them and so, like we mentioned, it could be something miraculous in the sense that Paul's the one who he needs to come to them to help impart it. But it could also, based on what we see later in the book of Romans, be something more along the lines of, of something to help them uh, better develop what they might already have to help further strengthen them in those things.
And so that's uh, just some different possibilities right there. But ultimately, the reason that he's looking to come to them, he wants to impart a spiritual gift so they might be established. Look in verse 12. Uh, he kind of you know, helps circle around and get to his point. Why does he want to do these things? He wants some encouragement from them. But he recognizes in him being encouraged by them, who else is going to be encouraged? They would be encouraged as well. Uh, the, it, the way that he words it there, uh, I like how he says that, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Uh, if something is mutual, what's that tell us? It's working together. Right? It goes both ways. It's something that's shared. Okay, well, what is it that's shared here? Faith in God. And, of course, specifically, what, what, uh, where is the faith in God here? In the gospel of His Son. So we're talking about the faith of who Jesus is and what Jesus did and ultimately what that can bring about for us. And so Paul is looking, you know, if we can share in this faith together, think about how greatly we can be encouraged. Think about how, how we benefit from that today. Uh, to know how all of us here in Mount Vernon today, we share a mutual faith. To think about, you know, we mentioned North Jefferson down the road in Mount Pleasant, we share a mutual faith. Are we encouraged when we are with them? Right. Well, why is it? We have a mutual faith. We can worship God together. We can uh, benefit. We can, we can serve others together because we're all working for the same purpose for the same reason. Think about those congregations elsewhere. We might be on vacation. Uh, we might not know anyone at the particular congregation, but we show up, we worship. More often than not, we can find encouragement in that. Many times they're encouraged by those who stop in to visit. Those of us who stop in to visit are encouraged as well. Mutual faith goes a long way. Johnny? I was going to say, also, you know, like he told the Corinthians, that we should all be of the same mind, that we should have the same mind as Christ, and that we should all say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right, an aspect of unity. Right. And that even goes back to Jared's lesson this morning. <laughs> And so, right, we, we can share in all those things. And like you say, when we have the same mind, well, we can have the same mind because we have the same faith. Right? We believe that same system we've submitted to and are obeying the same thing. And so we can have great encouragement from that. Um, thinking even more specifically then about Paul and about the church in Rome. And I'll get to you in just a second, Alvin. Um, looking specifically at Paul, the church in Rome, what all did Paul go through? because of his faith. He went through a lot. right? We could point to many different passages. We could look uh, towards the end of 1 Corinthians and see the, you know, the list of all the things he went through for his faith. Well, what had some of these Romans been through because of their faith? They'd been through their own fair share of persecution. So think about then when they could get together and they could more or less share some of those war stories. But they could all come back to the point that, uh, you know what? It was worth it. We share in this same faith. We see what's coming in the end. right? They could benefit and lift each other up. What if someone was going through something similar to what Paul was going through at the time? right? Paul could help to build them up, strengthen them in those things. There's encouragement to be found, again, in that mutual faith. Alvin? Oh, I, just, I was just going to say, the, the mutual faith is also the mutual Spirit. We all share in that same spirit. And when it's all Father, Son, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, then it's a full circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we, we're, all, uh, we're all able to do it because of the same God. Yes. And, and we believe the same system. We live, we work to obey that same system of faith. And so let's, uh, let's move on then into this next section here dealing with Paul's debt. This will be verses 13 through 15. If somebody could read Romans chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. 
gospel to you who are in Rome also. So looking in verse 13, Paul starts out, he says he doesn't want his brethren to be ignorant, doesn't want them to be unaware, and he says he often planned to do what? But, unfortunately, he had been what? He had been hindered. Uh, As I mentioned, back up in verse, uh, whatever verse that was, verse 10, uh, how it was that I had wanted to say something once we got down here. Uh, If we go over to Romans 15... Romans chapter 15, Paul tells us, at least in the present when he's writing it, what it is that was hindering him uh, because of the specific uh, thing that he was doing in his service. Somebody read Romans chapter 15, verses 20 through 22. So I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ is named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. And then go ahead and read verse 22. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. All right, so what's the reason? Paul was busy doing what? He was busy preaching the gospel to people who hadn't heard the gospel before. Well, Paul wanted to make sure that he's able to share the gospel with those individuals before he came to those in Rome. Those in Rome, the specific church here, they'd already heard the gospel, believed, and obeyed it. And so Paul was working to share the gospel with the Gentiles who had not yet heard the gospel. That's what was hindering him at the specific time. Uh, But Paul said he wanted to ultimately come to them, the end of verse 13, so that he might have some fruit among them also, just as among the other Gentiles. And that's what Johnny just read for us. He was working to bear fruit among the Gentiles by doing what? By sharing the gospel. What is it, verses 14, uh, verses 14 and 15, that he ultimately wants to do for those in Rome? Share the gospel, right? So you look into verse uh, 14. Verse 14, Paul says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. If you are a debtor, it means that you owe what? A debt. Paul doesn't say specific, you know, what the debt is, but he ultimately shows us how he can pay the debt. We mentioned it earlier. How is Paul going to be able to help pay this debt? By preaching the gospel. Um, He is, I'll get to you in just a second, Johnny. And so he is, in verse 14, uh, he mentions more or less kind of a division as far as how the, the Gentiles in Rome would have seen the world. He talks about those who were Greeks and barbarians. Basically, if you were not a Roman, if you were not a Gentile, then they saw you as being a barbarian. Uh, the Greeks especially, they saw themselves as being really wise and uh, very you know, scholarly. Think about uh, especially Acts 17. Uh, Paul goes to the Areopagus. He's before all of the Stoics and the philosophers and all these smart people. Well, if you aren't one of them, you were unwise. That's kind of what those divisions there are talking about. But there's also something in it to show that Paul uh, recognized no matter who you are, he's a debtor to you. What's the only way he could pay the debt back? No matter who you are, no matter your education. You share the gospel. The gospel is ultimately for everybody, right? Johnny? Mm-hmm. And he was called for the specific person, purpose, to teach the Gentiles. He wasn't called to teach the Jews like most of the other apostles. He was called specifically to spread the news to the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. And, and he's still, even in that, uh, he's still long to share the gospel with the Jews, and that's uh, really what we have later on in this, or in chapters 9 to 11 when we get there. He longed for the house of Israel to know, to obey the gospel, but he recognized not all of them would. But he also realized even among the Gentiles, not all of them would either. Uh, But right, that's what he was working to do, share the gospel with them, try to pay the debt back as best as he could. And so concerning that debt, he'd been paying it at least up to the point, sharing the gospel with other Gentiles. But verse 15, who else does he want to help pay the debt back to? to those who were in Rome. 
Okay, who is Paul writing to? He's writing to those in Rome. He's writing to the church. What's Paul want to do even for the church in Rome? What's he going to preach and teach? The gospel. Sometimes maybe we, we ask or we wonder, okay, why, uh, why do we have to go back over some of these things time and time again? Think about what Paul's saying. Who is the gospel for? It's for everyone. That means it's not only for the lost, but the gospel is also for the saved. Right? When we hear the gospel time and time again, and we hear those reminders about how Jesus came, how He lived, how He died, how He was resurrected from the grave, the attitude shouldn't be, why do we need to hear this time and time again? But the attitude ought to be encouraged. We ought to feel the love in that. Uh, we ought to be motivated to go and to share it with others to try to help pay back our debt. Paul was not afraid. Paul was not uh, ashamed, as he uses in verse 16, to share the debt, to pay the debt back. If we look in verses 16 and 17, we have the thesis here. Someone read Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, they, the just shall live by faith. We'll look more specifically in those two verses, Lord willing, next week. But thinking there about this point that Paul comes to, what Paul has done in these 17 verses, he, he yes, has explained who he is as, as a servant. But how is it that Paul serves? He preaches the gospel. The church in Rome was known throughout all the world because of the way that they were showing their faith. As we talked about, when we show the faith, like Aaron mentioned, we're working to bear fruit. Well, what's the end goal in all of those things? We're trying to help share the gospel with others. We're trying to help show others the love of God that's been shown to us. We're trying to ultimately show others how they can experience the same blessings that we do. They can be a part of the same family that we are. And it's all because of what God has done through His Son, Christ Jesus. How grateful are we for that? We can say we're grateful for it all day long, but are we showing it? Just to say that we believe, just to say it's important, is really of no importance. Are we showing it? What are we doing to try and help share this gospel with others? Paul focuses so much in this book of Romans on why the gospel matters on why the gospel is so important. All getting to the point of how it changes our lives. And if our life has not truly been changed by the gospel, why hasn't it been? Do we recognize what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus? Do we appreciate the fact that because of how Jesus became a perfect sacrifice for us, we have the hope that our sins can be washed away? We have the hope that just as Christ was risen from the dead, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and following shows us we can be risen from the dead as well. Are we living that way? And if not, won't you make a change tonight? Won't you come to God in obedience to the gospel of His Son for the first time? Or won't you make things right with Him by repenting of your sins, by uh, seeking the help of your brethren to help you do better, maybe even in sharing that gospel? Whatever it is, once you let it be known as we stand and as we sing.